So there, there's a number of times where when I'm talking about theology or life or things like that, the, the remembrances of growing up in a home that owned Christian bookstores floods my memories. And so there's pretty much not an occasion in scripture or things where I'm not reminded of a book that I sold or put on the shelf at my parents' store. And this morning is also like that. I remember when I was in my freshman year in high school, I was just starting to work on the floor at my parents' bookstore, and there was a book that came out that grew in popularity. As best as I can recall, we never ordered this to put it onto our shelves because it was ridiculous, but many people came into the store to order it. Remember, this is before Amazon, uh, and so people would have to go to a bookstore to order a book that they wanted to read if we didn't have it in stock. And the book that, w- that came out that year, in 19, end of 1987, beginning of 1988, was this, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. We're still here. It didn't happen. Okay? Edgar Wisenet wrote this book, and in, at, at, in interviews, he stated this, Only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. It's a pretty bold statement to ever say as it relates to Scripture. He also said, if if there were a king in this country and I could gamble with my life, I would stake my life that Jesus was coming back or that the rapture would occur on Rosh Hashanah 1988. He was wrong. But that didn't stop him from making more prognostications. He said, then again, 1989 it was going to happen, then 1993, then 1994, then 1997, and he died in 2001. You might recall 10 years ago, there was this guy by the name of Harold Camping, I think he was a radio personality, who also made predictions, and he said May 21st, 2011 was when the rapture was going to occur. And then when that date went by, he was like, oh, my calculations were off. It's actually going to be October 21st of 2011. We're still here. Didn't happen. And if those guys would have just read one of the verses that we're going to look at this morning, they wouldn't have been so foolish. They wouldn't have done what they did. And so this morning, we're going to look at all of Mark chapter 13. If you have a Bible... I would encourage you to open it up to Mark chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the pew back in front of you. I'd love for you to grab one of those and turn to page 849. We're not going to put the scripture on the screen this morning because we're going to go through the whole whole 37 verses, Uh, but I would love for you to follow along. But as you're turning there, I want us to consider a couple things. What is this passage talking about? One thing as we're reading this. Jesus' words, it seems are vacillating between something that was imminent, and what was imminent was 70 AD when Rome would come in and destroy the temple that was built where the people would go to worship that Josh had talked about in the middle of that song. And also, it seems that he's talking about the distant future, his glorious and final return. And there are are many theologians who think that Jesus is overlapping those two occasions. That will differ in terms of how you're reading and understanding. Sometimes he's talking about the near future. Sometimes he's talking about a future, uh, a distant future. But he's overlapping the two as he goes through this text, as we go through this text. And it's absolutely essential when reading the Bible. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. And it's especially important when we're talking about end times related issues. Is that... The meaning of the text has to make sense to the people who first read the text. So this text was written to first century Gentile Roman Christians. And they understood what Mark was writing to them. Our understanding of that text must correlate with what they understood. There there can't be two completely different understandings of the text for them and then for us. They have to correlate. They have to work together. And so as we read this text, keep those things in mind. What did it mean for them, and how does that give us understanding for today? 
So we are going to read the whole text, and so if you are able and, and willing to stand, would you please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word? Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 37, the text tells us this. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved." But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea fly, flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house or take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not, be, may not happen in winter." For in those days there will be such tribulation as had not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard." I have told you all these things beforehand. But in those days, after the tri that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and you fall asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So let me start by saying a few things as it relates to this. Some of you have been really into in the past or maybe even currently like thinking about and talking about end time stuff and maybe stuff that happens in this culture today, you're, you're wanting to talk about it more. Some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'm going to try and address both groups, um, which is a large gap. Okay, so first of all, I love the Bible. I love that the Word of God is clear about the things that we really need to know and understand in specific, and that is, in particular, the gospel. 
that we need to know and understand that we are sinners who are far from God, who desperately need him and to trust Jesus alone for salvation, to repent of our sins and trust him. And yet, that is clear. And yet, there is much in the scripture that is at times unclear, that's hard to figure out. Theologians who spend a lifetime studying God's word, if they're honest, will get to the end of their life and will go, I haven't even scratched the surface of this thing. That's good. There's always more to learn. There's always more to apply to our lives because we will not ever fully arrive to perfection in this life. Virtually every commentator I read about this chapter says something like this. A, a lot of really smart theologians who've studied the word for decades say this is the hardest chapter in this book to understand. So, we're going to try to understand as much as we can. And it's really important, I believe, to probably not definitively, definitively land on one understanding or interpretation of this passage because it's, there's so much going on. So much. There are some things in the Bible that are clear and there are some things that we will never fully understand and that's okay. Second, as I mentioned in the beginning, the church has had a fascination with trying to figure out the end times. Sometimes those desires are pure and there's a longing to understand how am I supposed to live in light of the reality that Jesus is coming back? And sometimes we're just silly. Sometimes we will We'll roll out these charts and diagrams and we try to parse every little word and we try to put God in this neat little tidy box and we think we got it all figured out and God is not to be figured out. We can't figure it all out. I can name three respected theologians right now, men that I have learned from and gained much from who all differ about what they understand Scripture is saying about the end times. It's hard to figure out. And so we need to be careful. The gospel is clear. Some other things are not always. And so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, maybe, maybe you've heard some of these terms before. Maybe you haven't. But as you, as you wrestle through scripture, are you dispensational? Are you historic premillennial? Are you postmillennial, amillennial? Are you pre, mid, or post-tribulational rapture view? Why? And if you don't know what any of those words mean, that's okay. It's maybe better right now that you don't. But if you, wanna, if you want to dive in and study and understand end times, what the Bible is saying about end times things, I will be happy to suggest some resources to you, and I'll probably suggest resources that lay out all the different viewpoints and say, now go study it. Like, wrestle through it. Don't just take one view and just dive all into that. Try and understand why there's different perspectives and what, what are they all trying to understand and portray. It's good to do that. And if you're sitting here, as I've mentioned, you're thinking, what in the world are you talking about? Stick with me. I'm glad that you're here. And my goal this morning is not to answer all the end times questions because we can't in the time that we have. And I believe that's a bit of a dead end to try to. My goal this morning is to help us understand what are we supposed to be doing, how are we supposed to be living, what are we supposed to be believing in light of the reality that Jesus is coming back? What, is our life, what are our lives supposed to look like? And this passage tells us very clearly, be on guard, stay awake, Jesus is coming back. Be on guard, Stay awake, Jesus is coming back. And so, as I've said, for those of you who want to know all the details about the end times, you're going to leave here frustrated. It's not going to answer all those questions. Sorry. But we are going to try and deal with what this text is telling us and, and to really see, frankly, what it wants us to do with our lives in light of the reality that Jesus is coming back. So, as we look at this text, verses 1 through 23 is essentially telling us persecution is coming. 
Persecution is coming. The passage opens up with the disciples amazed at the temple and the buildings in Jerusalem. And Jesus is like, yeah, you know what? It's all going to become rubble. Specifically, he says, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And of course, this concerns Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. And so they're on the Mount of Olives, and they, they're like, Jesus, when is this going to happen? Like, if Jerusalem gets decimated, then, then the reality is that, that God is ushering in his kingdom. This will be the end of all things. So when is this going to happen? They're curious, not too unlike us today. And then starting in verse 5, you'll notice that Jesus gives his disciples more than they can chew, and for us too, as I've mentioned. And what's particularly helpful in trying to understand this passage is to see and understand that in verses 5 through 37, Jesus gives 19 commands, 19 commands of how we're supposed to live in light of the reality that Jesus is coming back. Here's just a few of them. See that no one leads you astray. Do not be alarmed. Be on guard. Do not be anxious. Say whatever is given to you. Be on guard. Learn its lesson. Be on guard. Keep awake. Stay awake. Stay awake. Do you sense a theme? What Jesus is getting at? It's not all the little details of everything that's going to happen. It's, it's an emphasis towards commands of readiness. And so in verses 5 through 23, there's this emphasis by Jesus to be on guard and to not be afraid. Sure, he's giving his disciples some markers that they can understand of what's going to happen, but his primary focus for them and for us is to know that persecution is coming, be aware, and don't be anxious about it. He's telling us, he's telling them, the readers, Mark is, persecution is coming. There's something that's going to occur and be ready for it. Jesus is like the the young couple that's dating. And, And this couple has been talking about getting married. Marriage is coming up a lot in the conversations. And and the boyfriend says says to the girlfriend, Hey, hey, let's let's go out this Friday. We'll go go out and do something. Oh, what are we gonna do? Oh, you know, just go out to dinner and maybe a movie or something. Oh, do I, like, do I need to get my nails done beforehand? Like, and make sure my hands are looking all nice? Like, no, we're just going out for dinner and a movie. Like, why would you do that, right? Because she's thinking something's coming. Maybe the engagement ring is coming. Be prepared, right? She wants to be prepared. Jesus is saying, be prepared. Persecution is coming. It's not a fun engagement. Persecution is coming. Jesus is talking to his four disciples and he's giving them a, a heads up about what's coming. And it's concerning, right? Jesus said, there's going to be wars, there will be earthquakes, there will be famines. But then that's just the beginning of what's going to happen. Then he tells them in verse 9 that they're going to be arrested. They're going to be beaten. They're going to stand before governors simply because they believe and trust Jesus. And when that happens, Jesus says to them, don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Don't don't dwell on what you're going to do when that happens. They're going to put you before governors, and you're going to have to make a defense. You're going to give witness to Christ. Don't, Don't worry about what you're going to say, because in that moment, the Holy Spirit is going to tell you what to say. I would imagine in that scenario, they maybe didn't always listen to Jesus like we don't when certain situations come about in our lives that we know we're going to have to have a conversation with somebody that might be a little difficult. And so we, like, right, we spin in our head this conversation. I'm going to say this, and then this person's going to say this, and then I'm going to respond with this. Or if they say that, I'm going to respond with this response. And and we spin in our heads over and over and over about these conversations, wasting valuable energy. And Jesus is saying, in those situations and in this situation, don't waste your time. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say when you need to say it. 
If you're in Christ, you have the Spirit, He will tell you what to say, and you have this opportunity to bear witness to Jesus. But don't think after that, after you give this witness, that all will be well. It probably won't. It'll probably be very difficult. And in fact, the text tells us it will be difficult. It says family members will turn against one another. You'll be hated because of your belief in Jesus. And then he says, but persevere in the midst of these trials. Keep trusting Christ. Keep leaning into him. This is what Jesus wants us to know about the end. Not, not all the details. He wants us to know. Be on guard so you can persevere. Be aware of what might come so when those difficulties do come, you can keep moving forward. So in verses 1 through 23, he's talking about probably something that was imminent. And, and the, the turn, the hinge of this text that deviates into lots of different understandings about what the text is saying is verse 14. So look at verse 14 again. Jesus says this, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Do you understand? What is that? What is Jesus talking about? The abomination of the desolation. Well, it seems like the readers would understand, so what is he talking about? Well, again, this is where a lot, there's a lot of deviation about what is Jesus is talking about here, but, but let me at least lay out three interpretations. One interpretation is that Jesus is talking about something that happened centuries before, a couple thousand or a couple hundred years before, where Jerusalem was invaded and there was one who stood in the temple and desecrated the temple. Might be talking about what was going to occur. So in 70 AD, when, when the Rome was going to crush Jerusalem and there was going to be things that occurred in that time that was going to desecrate the temple, or he's talking about something in the distant future that we have not yet seen or experienced yet. And there's a lot of other interpretations beyond those. Here's, here's what I understand the text is saying, that Jesus is using language from the book of, J of Daniel that many believed occurred in second, uh, the second century BC, this desecration that happened in the temple, and that he's using that language to point forward to what was going to occur in 70 AD. So there was going to be the destruction of Jerusalem, and there was going to be things that happened in the temple that would desecrate the temple, and at the same time, He's using that situation to point to something much future, much in the future. That's what I understand is going on here. And I can't get in all even more deep. There's so many more details, but we, we don't have time for that. So, so then in verses 14 to 23, what we see is Jesus, what I talked about before, going back and forth between something that was going to happen in the near future to something in the distant future. He's talking about the fall of the temple in 70 AD, when Rome crushes Palestine, as well as something much later when the tribulation occurs, or a tribulation, or tribulations occur. And this is, this is what prophecy does many times. Prophecy will talk about, hey, there's something that's coming up soon, and there's also pointing to something much more in the future. And so church, what I want us to see, though, is to understand, look how good Jesus is to us. Look how good he is to us. He's telling us what's going to occur. He's telling the first readers what is going to occur. He's telling his listeners, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, what is going to occur. Now, you, you're not going to know all the details, all the specifics, but there's things that are coming that we will not be exempt from. There is tribulation, tribulations that we will not be exempt from. Some of these things have been happening for millennia, right? This is the darkness before the dawn. Millions have suffered because of Christ, but Jesus is gracious in letting us know this is going to occur. Be on guard. Persevere. Don't, 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 don't hear these words and think, okay, I got to build an impenetrable shelter and go out and buy generators. It's not the point. 
point is to be on guard. Jesus, in his perfect revelation, is helping us to be aware of what is coming, encouraging us not to be anxious of these persecutions that are coming, but to persevere in the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulty. We, we, don't, we don't know what lies ahead of us, but, it, but, but we could face difficulties as followers of Christ. And so if that could happen, be ready. Persevere, trust, be on guard. And how do we be on guard? We, we, we're on guard by filling up with him. By being in the word, by, by pursuing holies, by trusting him. That's how we are on guard. So, so the text tells us, be on guard, stay awake. Jesus is coming back. And there will be persecution before he comes. And then the text moves on and gets to this pinnacle of, of saying in verses 24 to 27, Jesus is coming back. This is good news. For those of us in Christ, he is coming back for us. And notice the text says, after the tribulation, after the difficulties, then Jesus comes back and there are some pretty crazy cosmological events. Look at verses 24 and 25 again. It says this, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from the heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. That's terrifying, right? That's, that's kind of scary stuff for the sun to get darkened and, and then the moon to not give its light, for stars to be falling. Now, we don't know if that is all literally going to happen or if there is some figurative language that Jesus is using to describe this. But what Jesus is using is he's using Old Testament language as well as Peter picks up on this in his epistle. And so he's not talking about some random craziness stuff. He's, he's using language that the people would know and understand that there are going to be things, terrifying events in God's universe that will be just before Jesus comes back, and then he comes back. And the text tells us in this, in this passage that he comes in the clouds. Jesus comes in the clouds. Josh talked about the cloud coming into the temple and the tabernacle and, and Jesus ushering in. And here we, again we see that the God-man comes in the clouds. God's presence comes to the earth. And, and that picture is even grown and is shown bigger in Revelation chapter 19. If you want to flip over there, it's the last book of the Bible, one, one of the last chapters in the Bible in Revelation chapter 19, where it's starting in verse 11. It says this, then I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword from which he strikes down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron." He will tread the winepress of the fury, the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So not only will there be these terrifying cosmological events, there will be a terrifying entrance of the king on his horse to take to himself those who are his. And that's the good news. Jesus doesn't come back just to destroy everything. He comes back to gather to himself those who are his. And before I expound on that a little bit, I want, I want us to see, church, again, that we will suffer before this occurs. Do, do you see the timeline of things that this text is saying? It says that the church is gathered after that tribulation, not before. Suffering has always been the mark of Christians. Why? Because our Savior suffered. So we, we don't get exempt from suffering. We, we get to go through that. For the last 2,000 years, millions have lost their lives because they trusted Jesus. Tribulation is happening, right? Right? We see that around us. 
Look around. For the last 2,000 years, the world is broken. There will be suffering that we will go through, and maybe an intensification of the suffering before Jesus comes back, but we will not be exempt from that. Some of you, knowing a little bit of modern church history, some of you have, have been influenced by books like The Late Great Planet Earth, or, or for others, there was a series of fiction books that came out called The Left Behind series a number of years ago. And for some of you, if you're my age or older, you will remember the terrifying films of A Thief in the Night. I, I, remember, I remember, I can still picture the scene in one of those movies of the guillotine and the head's getting lopped off. It's terrifying stuff. Some of those, those books and some of those movies get wrapped into trying to parse everything out that's happening in the world and try to equate it to what's going on today. And I would encourage us to be careful. Be careful there. That there's... there's there, there, there might be this idea of being raptured out before the tribulation, but it seems to me like the Bible says Christians will go through suffering. And don't be so sure that we will not. I think it's very likely that we will. But the good news is, for those of us in Christ, whether we go through an intensification of tribulation or not, we will be gathered to him, to the one who's coming back. So wherever you land on end times things, the reality is, if you're in Christ, he will gather you to himself. That's our hope. That's what we, we cling to. And, and it's only for those who have come and trusted Jesus alone for salvation. And so the call goes out. We don't know when Jesus is coming back and be prepared, be on guard. How? By trusting Christ. By seeing and recognizing that we are sinners far from him, by turning from our sin and clinging and trusting to Jesus alone for salvation. If that is us, we will be gathered to him. And when that happens, there will be no more suffering, no more death, no more cancer, no more, no more riots charging capital buildings, creating unrest. There will be only peace and love and hope and, and faith and trust and the presence of Christ. All will be over and all will be well. So don't miss what this is telling us to hang on to. What are we to hang on to? Hope. Hang on to hope. What do you hope for? Stop and think about that for a second. What do you hope for? Do you hope for there to be no more snow this winter? Do you hope for a smooth transition in our government in a couple days? Do you hope for, I don't know, to be married? Do you hope that your kids will get good jobs when they grow up so they move out of the house? What do you hope for? All those things that I just mentioned are all temporary. They're all part of this world. Jesus is telling us to remain hopeful. So what do we remain hopeful for? We remain hopeful for his return. For his coming back, for his gathering to himself those who are his. That's what we hope. And that hope is sure. Some of the other things that I mentioned might not ever happen. But we can take it to the bank that Jesus is coming back. And he is coming back to bring us to himself. That is what we hope for. And so be on guard. Stay awake. Jesus is coming back. And finally, this text ends with telling us, stay awake. Stay awake. Verses 28 through 37 
tell us this. Now, verses 28 through 31, if you were fl- following the flow of the argument, again, I've mentioned that Jesus is vacillating between something in the near future, at least for them at that time, and something in the distant future. And here, Jesus is going back to the near future. So he's going back to an earlier timeline. And in verses 28 through 31, he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. We can see, him, we can see this by him talking about these things that are going to take place in verses 29 and 30. And then we can see in verse 31 that he talks about this generation will not pass away until these things take place. So there's something for those people to understand at that time. But then this paragraph concludes for us with more hope for us. Look at what it says in verse 31. Everything around you might feel like it's falling away, and in the end, the the current heavens and earth will fall away, and there will be a a new heavens and a new earth. But, But what does Jesus say? But my words, my words will not pass away. We can take hope in what he says that what he says will finally and fully occur and it will be true for all of eternity. This is what we hope in. This is what we cling to. And then Jesus caps off this discourse with verses 32 through 37. And I want to read those again. And as I read them, I want you to pay attention to Jesus' tone. Listen to his tone in verses 32 through 37. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Four times in six verses, Jesus either says, keep awake or stay awake. You think he's trying to drive a point home for us to understand? First, stay awake because you don't know when he's coming back. Those fools that I talked about at the earlier thought they'd give it a shot. But notice what Jesus says. No one knows, not even the son knows when he's coming back. Now you might hear that and think, wait a second, I thought Jesus is fully man and fully God. He is. Which helps us understand why he can say that. Philippians 2 Verses 6 through 7 says this, Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus took on humanity. He did not lose his deity. He took on humanity. He's fully man while at the same time being fully God. So what this means, what this seems to be saying, that Jesus doesn't know his return is that for a time, Jesus relinquished the free exercise of his divine attributes. There are times he set that aside. And this was so in part so that he could live an authentic human life. He knew, he grew, he he gained understanding so he could live a life that we live and understand our lives. And he lived that in submission to his father. And this is one more way that he is submitting to his father. He is being dependent on the Holy Spirit. And so what's the point? We don't know when Jesus is coming back. So stay awake. Stay awake. If it's true that we don't know, then why do we get caught up in this? When I was in youth ministry, every once in a while I would say, hey, students, what book do you want to go through? Always Revelation. Want to go through Revelation? Help me understand when Jesus come back. What's going on? What, what do all these things mean? We... we too often we'll look at what's going on currently and we look at the newspaper and we try and line it up with the Bible and we go, okay, what, where, what's, what's going on here? Where, what's that? What's this? How does this, this all fit together? 
There's many teachers and theologians who just get silly with this. I've already said this. Like there, there will be some who will look and study Revelation and look at Revelation chapter 9 and go, oh, scorpions. Oh, that's helicopters flying around and the sting is the missiles coming from them. You can go find this stuff. It's silly. What if Jesus waits another 500 years before he comes back and there's no more helicopters? You, you, it's silly. And then people go, who's the Antichrist? Says that there's going to be an Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? And for decades and centuries, especially more recently, there's been this fascination with trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. Did you know it was Mikhail Gorbachev because he had this crazy birthmark on his forehead? Do you know that? Did you know it was Ronald Wilson Reagan? Because each letter, because he had six letters in each name, 666. Did you know that the Antichrist is every Roman Catholic pope? Did you know that Barack Obama is the Antichrist? Did you know that Nero is the Antichrist? Did you know Prince William is the Antichrist? Did you know Bill Gates is the Antichrist? And every Apple lover goes, amen. Know that? Did you know, in researching this, I found this, Danny DeVito is the Antichrist. <laughs> you know why? This is what he, this is why. Because he starred in a One Direction video called Steal My Girl. It's silly. And what, suppose that smart people come up with this stuff. Stop. Just stop. Stop trying to figure it out. We'll know. Don't try and connect the dots that aren't there. And, the, and this goes along, it doesn't necessarily go with this text, but it goes along with this. If you're reading books by authors who are trying to squeeze America into Old Testament prophecy. America is not in Old Testament prophecy. We are not the new nation of Israel. We are not a chosen people. America is not. America will be one nation among many who will fall down and worship the king. At some point, we'll probably be gone. The point What's the point? Stay awake. Stay awake. So what, is, what does that mean? All of this is designed, Jesus is saying all of this to make us faithful Christians. Not to figure out all the different prophecies and speculations about the distant future. Jesus' purpose in this text is to encourage us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. Which is, love God, love others, make disciples. Sometimes it can be as simple as that. The Evangelical Free Church is a Christian denomination of which I'm ordained in. It's the denomination that I'm ordained in. And in their statement of faith, the ninth statement in their statement of faith it says this, we believe in the personal, bodily, and glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ at a time known only to God demands constant expectancy and, as our blessed hope, motivates the believer to godly living, sacrificial service, and energetic mission. That's what it means to stay awake. Godly living, sacrificial service, energetic mission. The duty of the doorkeeper at the end of this passage is to stay awake and be on guard. That's his job. Our job as followers of Christ is godly living, sacrificial service, energetic mission. This is what it means to stay awake. This is what he's calling us to. He's giving us a warning, like you're going to get persecuted. He's giving us hope. He's coming back to gather to himself those who are his. And so, be ready. Stay awake. Godly living. Sacrificial service. Energetic mission. Might the Lord catch us in these activities when he comes back. If he should come soon. I cannot give you one definitive reason why Jesus will return in 2021. Not one. But he might. 
he might come back this year. I would say, come Lord Jesus, like, let's go. Let's, let's set it all right and make it right. He might come this year, or he might come in 2521, or a thousand years beyond that. He might come in our lifetime. He might not come in our lifetime. But as we wait, let us stay awake. Let us pursue lives that are godly and holy. Let us serve sacrificially those that he puts in our path. And let us be ones who are proclaiming the mission that he has given us of what it means to be reconciled to God, to be redeemed by him. For that is what Jesus has done for us. So now let us go and have a full and future hope with him, with our eyes set on him. Would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning and this opportunity to come and worship you. Father, would you help us in this, would you help us to fix our eyes on Jesus? Would you help us to live godly lives? Would you help us to serve sacrificially? Would you help us to engage the mission of the church energetically? All for your glory and for the good of those around us. Father, we need you. We trust you. And might we declare, Jesus, come back soon. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, and